I just want to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus and, and just thank you for being here. It was, uh, it's always good to uh, be away in order to appreciate what you have back home, if that makes sense. Uh, certainly, uh, we love this church and are thankful for each one of you. And, and so today I want to talk with you about the, the topic of godliness. Uh, this is a term that uh, we probably don't use as much as we should, which is a question which is, are you a godly person? Uh, this word can mean pious. And in fact, uh, James, uh, James the, uh, the apostle, not James who wrote the book of James, but James who was the leader of the church of Jerusalem was called James the Just. That's a pretty good name, isn't it? James the Pious. James the Godly would be another way to, to express that. And so when we talk about godliness, the question for us today is, are we a godly person? Not just in the terms whether we think we, we ourselves are godly, but does God look at, at us as reflecting his godliness? Do we reflect the attributes of God so that we then are godly? Or would we, as 1 Corinthians 3 says, be called worldly? Paul had a pretty stark condemnation for the Corinthian church. He says, I would not address you as spiritual or as godly but as fleshly or as worldly, as carnal, one translation describes it. Sarks. You're sarksy. You're fleshly. You're, you're like the world. You look more like the world than you look like God. And I would say to us as TBCers, we want to be a godly church, right? We want to reflect him and, and be an accurate reflection of him in every way. And we have a long way to go, do we not? To actually say we that I'm a godly man or I'm a godly pastor. And you've heard me say of my, my big five, Lord, I, I want to get an A with you, that I'm godly in my pursuit, as Calvin so beautifully described, of pursuing that relationship with Christ, as Paul says, to know him, that I account all things as rubbish, the one thing that I may know him and I may gain him. Is that true? And then two is, is do, am I a godly man in the sense of being a godly husband to my wife, that I'm a, a servant leader, and I'm a good example for her, and I love her as Christ loved her. I'm selfless, and I'm, and I'm, a, I'm servant-hearted, put her above myself. Am I a godly father, where I model before my, my children authentic, true, biblical Christianity? Or do they say, oh, that's Christianity, that's just so hypocritical out there, I don't want anything to do with that. No, I, I want to model for them, I want to be a godly father, disciple my kids and know the word, and love the word, and, and live the word. And, and then for the, am, am I a godly pastor? Am I praying for you? Am I, do I really love you? Do I pursue those who, who are, are fleeing from Christ? Do I, do I mend, tend, fend, and send? Do I, do I mend and put people back together spiritually? Do I pray for them in their heartaches and their needs? Do I, am I willing to serve them as, as we see that great eldership example of Paul in Acts 20 where he says, I instructed each one of you with tears. To, and he says, as 1 Corinthians 1 says, I labor with all his energy to present every man, every man, every man mature in Christ, going house to house if necessary. And then lastly, am I a godly evangelist where I care, I have God's heartbeat for the lost. I, my heart breaks where, where his heart breaks and it longs to see people reconcile to Christ. Would I be considered by God a godly man? That's our topic today. And so, and so the title of my sermon today is The Secret of Godliness. I know I put contentment, but as I uh, kind of came into the final lapse of my sermon, I changed it a little bit. Really, what is the secret of godliness? Because yes, part of the secret of godliness is, is going to be contentment. But it's not being content for the sake of being content. Because it's not about just you being satisfied or you feeling okay about your life. Really, the, the secret is about really reflecting the attributes of God in your life, is it not? And so there is a secret of godliness that I want to talk about today. And our text is 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 12. And I know we, we read verses 6 to 16, but let me read for you the first couple verses here. And, and it does apply. It's talking about even this terrible thing of, of slavery in the ancient world. And it starts off, it says, 1 Timothy 6, 1, all who are under the yoke of slaves, and this is what I'm talking about, I think, literal slavery in a... In a you know, being owned by another human being to just do whatever they want. In regard to their own masters, it says, all who are under the yoke of slavery are to regard their own masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. 
Those who, are belie- who have believers as their masters must not dis- be disrespectful to them, but um, because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach then these principles. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does, that does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, there's our key word, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. That's supposed that godliness is a means of gains. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And then talks about we can take nothing out of the world. We brought nothing into it. We can take nothing out of it. But godliness with contentment is great gain. To get us thinking about this, I ask myself, what is godliness? What is godliness? And some of you are familiar with a, a great author named Jerry Bridges. It writes under Nav Press. I believe spent some time with the Navigators. And he has written many books, The Pursuit of Holiness, and or actually that might be Tozer. But uh, here's a book out of, out of an article, What is Godliness? He writes this, Bridges. He says, Godliness is something more than just Christian character. Although we've all heard the word, few of us can give back a quick or easy definition for godliness. We read little about it, unfortunately. He says it's been treated little little in Christian literature, but we would do well to conclude that it's important and that we need to understand it so that we can further go down this road of Christian living and this calling God's given us. In in this excerpt, as I said, it's called The Practice of Godliness. There's the book name. Bridges goes on to say, he says, we need to see the importance that this is a foundational spiritual attribute and to commit ourselves to building it into our lives now. No higher compliment can be paid to a Christian than to call him a godly person. He might be a conscientious parent, a zealous church worker, a dynamic spokesman for Christ, or a talented Christian leader or musician, but none of these things matter if at the same time he is not a godly person. The words godly and godliness actually appear only a few times in the New Testament, yet the entire Bible is a book of godliness. And when those words do appear, they are pregnant with meaning and instruction for us. When Paul wants to distill the essence of the Christian life into one brief paragraph, he focuses on godliness. He tells us that God's grace, quote, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present world as we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Titus 2, 11 through 13. When Paul thinks of his own job description as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he describes it as being called to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to, say it with me, godliness. Oh, you didn't say it with me. Let's try it again. Everyone's awake here. Let's say it, to, say it with me. That leads to? Thank you. All right. Making sure you're with me. Paul, especially, I've been in the South. Man, they really respond when I say amen. Like, but boom, I, I kind of got, and they can sing so loud. We need to be like that. All right. So a little participation here. Paul especially emphasized godliness in his first letter to Timothy, our passage today. We are to pray for those in authority, chapter two, that we may le- live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We are to train ourselves to be godly, chapter 4. We are to pursue godliness. The word pursue indicating unrelenting, persevering effort. Godliness with contentment, chapter 6, is held forth as great gain. Literally, megas, great gain. And so we are to live content and lives for great gain. And finally, godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. When Peter, and looking forward to the day when the Lord would return, when the earth and everything in it will be destroyed, asks, what kind of people are we to be? And he answers that we are to live holy and godly lives. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Here, Peter uses the most momentous a momentous event in all history to stir us up in our Christian duty, which is holy and godly living. Surely then godliness is not optional. Godliness is no optional spiritual luxury for a few quaint Christians of a bygone era for some group of super saints. 
No, it's for today. It's both the privilege and duty of every Christian to pursue godliness, pursue godliness, and to train ourselves to be godly, to study diligently the practice of godliness. We don't need any special talent or equipment. God has given us, each one of us, quote, everything we need for life and godliness, 2 Peter uh, 1, 3. The most ordinary Christian has all that he needs, and the most talented Christian must use those same means in the practice and pursuit of godliness. What then is godliness? What are the marks of a godly person? How does a person become godly? I have answered a number of people this question. What do you think of those who think of godliness? The answers, though very, always end up expressing some kind of Christian character, such as expressions of godlike or Christ-like or the fruits of the Spirit. Godliness, then, is certainly a part of Christian character, but it's more than that. It's a more fu fundamental aspect of godliness than even character. It is basically, he sums it up in this word, devotion in action. Devotion in action. Are you one who's devoted by all your thoughts and all your actions towards being like God and pleasing to God? Is that you? Does that describe the kind of person you are? One who's devoted in action? And then I like this. If you want to be godly, you've got to be focused on God. Is your life, would it be said of you, Chad Laird, is, if he has one focus, one consuming passion, it's a focus on God and being like God and pleasing to God. Is that you? Is that me? A focus on God, and then he gives three aspects, Bridges, in defining this, sparing you the rest of the article. The fear of God, he says, is part of this focus on God. That we are God fears. Next, he says, is that we have a love of God. We are God lovers. We're gripped by God's love with a consuming passion to reciprocate to everyone and to him the love he's first shown us. As the Bible says, we love because he first loved us. And then a part of this focus on God is a desire for God. Certainly, if you're familiar with John Piper, really stresses this emphasis in every one of his books and sermons. That do you have a thirst for God? Do you desire God? Are you satisfied and content in God? If you had nothing else in this world, no material possessions, no relationships, and you just had God, would that be enough for you? What is godliness? Well, Fortunately, we have the Holy Scriptures to give us even an even better definition than Bridges, even better than this dictionary definition. The, the godly, and the, when I looked it up, means conforming to the laws and wishes of God to be a devout and pious man or that which comes from God. And I would say to you, as godliness comes from God and is enabled by God as you seek God. It's, it's, it's having character and actions and thoughts that are in keeping with the, that which is divine, the divine thoughts and actions and attitudes. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Here's a little bit of, of humor for you. All right. Uh, in the old English before a thousand, this comes from old English, godlik. All right. So, you know, if that's your, uh, you know, you, instead of cowlick, Caleb and Wesley, you know, we need to comb that hair in the morning. We're gonna call you, hey, I want you to be godlik this morning. All right. Are you godlik? Are you, are you righteous, holy, good? Or are you opposite of that wicked and uh, impious? This word in the Greek now, let's bring it full disclosure. This word, as we look it up in 1 Timothy 6, is this word Eusebia. Everyone say that with me. Eusebia. All right? This it means piety, being pious or holy like God. And it comes from U, which, or U, which means well. And Sebia or Sebo means to worship. You, that means you're a good worshiper. Are you a godly, good worshiper? Or would God say, man, you're average worshiper, a poor worshiper, a, a, a two times a year worshiper, C&E Christian, right? No, we want to be a good worshiper. I want to be UCB. I want to, I want to be a good worshiper every day, every moment of my life, which, and that's why it says in scripture, find out what's pleasing to God. And can I tell you what's pleasing to God? To be a good worshiper, to be a good worshiper. This is what it means to be godly in the Greek work. Let's now break it even further. So now in the last part of the sermon, I'm going to give you seven characteristics from 1 Timothy 6 of a godly person. Here we go. Seven characteristics of a godly person. We're going to see that a godly person seeks to dot, 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 seven things. We're going to look out. A godly person seeks to represent the name of God well. Number two, to serve and love others well. To know and live sound doctrine well to be content and satisfied fully in Christ, to flee evil and then to pursue righteousness, to then fight the good fight for longing in eternity, 
and then fight the good fight. And oh, say so I did that twice. I guess we really need to fight that good fight then. Uh, maybe I just needed seven, but uh, hey, make sure you get it twice there. I must have missed one here. All right, let's look at this. The first one. Right? So we see a godly person seeks to, number one, represent the name of God well. Let me ask you, those who know you, are you representing your king well? Jesus calls us to be ambassadors for Christ as if God is making his appeal through us be reconciled to Christ. We see that in 1 Timothy 6, 1, all who under the yoke of slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Even in this context of slavery, in the worst situation, far worse than ours, Paul is saying, are you representing the name of God? Well, what is the name of God? We covered this last week. I covered this at the funeral. Yahweh, whenever you see the word capital, L-O-R-D, all caps, that's the personal name of God, Yahweh. Also sometimes pronounced Yehovah. All right, but Yahweh, Yehovah, basically means, comes from the, the Hebrew root word Hava, which is the, with the, the root word to be. God is the one who causes all things to be, is he not? You would not be, you would not be is or here unless God made you to be, to exist, to have your being. And Yahweh is the one who causes all things to be, is he not? And this name Yahweh is salvation. It's a, it's a, a kind of conjunction word where that's the name of Jesus, the name above every name is that Yahweh, the one who caused all things to be, is salvation to you and I, Amen. He is the one who saves us from our sin, saves us from the wrath to come. And we want to say, when I represent Yahweh in this world, that I represent, he is the true creator and he is the only savior of the world. Do I represent that name well? So that no one can speak against my God, the only God, the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, Yahweh is salvation. Every knee in heaven on earth shall bow um, and, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see the sa same idea in uh, Acts 5.41, that the apostles, they were uh, in prison, they were told to stop preaching in this name. What, they continue to do so, they suffer persecution, and when they had been released and God had given them great grace, it says, Acts 5.41, they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name, amen? And every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on preaching and teaching Jesus as the Christ. Number two is we see that we are to serve and love others well. A godly person not only represents the name well, but we serve and love others well. Do you see that here? It says those who are believers as their master must not be disrespectful because they're brethren, but serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Do you treat each other in this church as beloved of God? You are the beloved. You're the beloved ones of God. You're beloved to God and you should be beloved to me and, to every, and we should be beloved to each other. This word beloved comes from that word agape, which we're familiar to, divine, unconditional, selfless, sacrificial, servant-type love. And this word agapitas, which means beloved, means to love. You are the beloved. And I would say to you, have we forgotten the command of John 13, 34 through 35, where our Lord left one command for us to pursue that kind of sums them all up. A new command I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Can I ask you to your neighbors, your unsaved relatives, your coworkers, do they know that you are disciples of Jesus Christ because of the way you love? Do they ever know you're a Christian? Do you ever speak of the name? Do you ever love and show this astounding love because of the name, because of the love? Or they're like, oh, I didn't even know Chad was a Christian. He never talks about it. He, he never acts like it. I, I thought he was just like everybody else. Is it obvious that you are in love with Jesus Christ? Is it obvious you're his ambassador? Is it obvious you are that god fear, that devout man of action, that devout man of character, that devout person who's not ashamed of the gospel, tell everybody else about what saved you from the wrath of God to come? And then the way you love others is so Christ-like and selfless and sacrificial. It's not about you. They would say, that person's been with Christ. Chad Laird, he's been with the Savior. He knows Jesus Christ. I want them to say that about me. 
I want to love selflessly, sacrificially, and unconditionally as my Lord has loved me. Number three, a godly person also seeks to know, live, and teach sound doctrine well. You've heard many people say doctrine divides. <coughs> doctrine is not important. Doctrine is, is just makes you spiritually proud. You know, they, and they kind of twist scripture. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Therefore, let's just, you know, and they, I call it the Rodney King theology, right? Let's just all get along. No. Notice how important sound doctrine is to a godly person. We have to know it. We have to live it. And we have to live it and know it so well we can teach it to others. And I would say to you, some of you <coughs> are still infants spiritually in your knowledge of the doctrine. In the youth group, I've been kind of pounding them lately. And I would ask you here, not to put any on the spot, if I ask you, what are the five elementary teachings of Christ in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2? I've taught on that probably five to 20 times here in seven years here. But would you know that five list of things? Do you have that nailed down? If I were to ask you, give me, the, give me the five verses on where it's repentance and faith, the essence of the gospel, could you list those off? If I ask you, where are the five verses about the blood, which is what we talked about in youth group last, the, uh, just on the blood, and where does it say about the blood, how it cleanses you from all sin? Do you know those? Do you have the basics? Do you know your Bible, the sound words of doctrine, so you can not only live it and teach it, but defend it? from others who are attacking it. We see or teach and prescribe these principles. If anyone advocates a different doctrine that does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, all true doctrine, by the way, conforms to making someone more godly. If not, he's conceited and understands nothing. He has just a morbid interest in controversial questions, disputes about words, out of which arrive envy, strive, abuse of language, evil suspicions and produces constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose godliness is a means of great of gain. How many false teachers out there in their Learjets, in their conditioned, uh, air-conditioned dog houses, I guess their dogs are in their air-conditioned, they're not in, the, in their dog houses, but they're air-conditioned, and, and with their big, wife's poofy hair and lipstick that's about a mile thick, how many of those people have seen that godliness is a means of great, it's just a means of gain? Reporter in the last month asked Creflo Dog, Dollar, why do you need a Learjet? jet? Why do you need $65 million to buy yourself a jet? You know, he says, well, it's because I'm bringing the gospel around the world. Oh, yeah? When we check the logs, it shows you're taking vacations with all your church staff and family around with it, not doing a whole lot of anything for anybody. Sad. By the way, the federal government has a way of doing that too with all of our tax money, right? And I would say to us, that this word, there's two words when we see, we see first of all, this word, um, it says, make sure no one's teaching a different doctrine. It's actually one word in the Greek, which means teach something else, right? It's something, a different doctrine, something that's not according to what Jesus taught us. And can I tell you, most of what is on TBN and that horrible network and on TV is a different doctrine, a health, wealth, prosperity doctrine. Turn it off. Don't waste your time. Or have discernment to know maybe the one or two good programs to know this guy teaches in accordance with the Bible and it conforms to godliness, it produces holy godly lives, and this does not. This is trash. This is a waste of time. This is filth. Second word is, is the section is, so that was the word different doctrine. One word, which means a different or other than true doctrine. Heterodiscaleo, which is then the second word we come as sound words, two words, sound Hugiano, which is to be sound or healthy, and logos, sound or healthy words. You should have a, a discernment meter that goes off and say, that's in line with sound words. That's in line with the Bible. That's in line with the character of Christ. That's in line with what's true. And aren't you glad for the scripture who is your canon, your measuring rod, to measure right from wrong, good from evil, that you have that discernment meter in the word of God. And the only way you can have discernment is if you know the word enough, then to measure every man's words or opinions against the word of God to know whether it's good or not, to know whether it's sound or unsound. And finally, we see this word. It says, with a doctrine conforming to godliness, didaskalia. Didasco is the word to teach, and didaskalia means instruction, instruction from God, that he, instruction, he instructs us with very specific functions and information on how to live like he lived, to how to be godly. And so a true Christian loves doctrine. A true Christian embraces doctrine. A true Christian seeks to be an expert in doctrine. 
And my friends, all of you, not just the pastors and the elders, are called to be experts in the doctrine, sound in the doctrine. And you know what it says in Hebrews 5? So some of you are not ready for that. You need to be taught the elementary teachings all over again. You're acquainted with milk, not ready for salt food. It says, but for the mature, it says by constant use, there's that training, kind of like a weightlifter. He lifts every day, not just once a month, have trained themselves spiritually to discern good from evil. You're an undiscerning person. It's because you're not constant in the word, consistent in prayer. You're not in the doctrine. So if you ever hear a Rob Bell say doctrine divides, doctrine is important, know that he is a false teacher. Know that someone who ever downplays the importance of doctrine is not telling you what is in line with sound words. Fourth, a godly person seeks to be content and satisfied in Christ, in Christ alone. If you've been here at any length of time, you have found out, probably the hard way, the materialism and things of this earth doesn't satisfy you. Pleasures doesn't satisfy you as, as great as the gift of intimacy with your wife or spouse is. That doesn't fully satisfy. Gods in a bottle who make you feel momentarily good for a while doesn't satisfy. Nothing in this life will ever satisfy any of you, ever. The only way you will ever be full and satisfied and content is in Christ Jesus because that's what you're made for. You can worship everything and anything else. Worship yourself, things, pleasure, fame, power, you name it. You will always be empty. Always. You will always be longing for something more. And the world has this God-shaped void. And only Christ comes and says, I made you to be a worshiper of the true and living God. And until you are doing that which worships the true and living God, you will be empty. You will never be full. And we will never be fully satisfied until we are worshiping all the time in heaven, right? Then we'll finally be whole because that's what we're made for. That is our purpose. And we see this word, you see, but I want to be a good worshiper. That's the word godliness. And it's a means of megos, great, poresmos, great gain. It's the greatest achievement, the greatest gain. It's not money, it's not things, it's not status. How many of our young people are taught through television to be famous? And we even have this thing where now you have to go out and kill people in order to be famous. And that, if, you, if that's your last resort, do that. No, you have the greatest gain when you are a content in Christ. So is it possible to be content in singleness? Paul says, yes. Is it possible you're content in poor circumstances? Job says, yes. Is it possible to be content in prison? Paul and Silas say, yes. Is it possible to be content in being poor? Paul says, yes. Many of the apostles. And in fact, is it possible to be content even if they kill us? All 11, all 11 uh, 10 of the 11 remaining disciples would say what? Yes. To die is gain. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. It's worth it. I can be content. As we see here, this word contentment actually means self-satisfied. And the irony is you will never be satisfied in self. The only way yourself will be satisfied is in denying yourself and being all about Christ. Are you a content person? This, this Greek word, Atarkeia means self-satisfied, a contentment that is sufficed or assisted. And I can tell you, you will never be satisfied other than in him. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 gives us a great verse on contentment. And it talks about how we're to build others up in the fullness of Christ, to a stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, verse 13. It says, then we'll no longer be children tossed here and fro by waves of deceitful doctrine, stricter men, deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the, the head Christ, who from the whole body being fitted and held together by every joint supplies according to the proper working of its individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of, of, of itself up in love. That's contentment. And when we grow and see ourselves be more like Christ and we see ourselves doing what God made us for to be good worshipers. So the question, we went through this in Sunday school. We got through half of it. We'll do the other half next week, by the way. We won't, but I want to ask you, what kind of person are you? Are you, if you ask yourself what kind of person, then ask your wife this week, ask your kids this week, and in your quiet time, do the real dangerous question. Ask God this week. God, what kind of person am I in your eyes? 
Marissa, what kind of person am I in your eyes? Children, what, what kind of a dad am I in your eyes? Truth about what kind of pastor am I in your eyes? Am I an honest person or a corrupt person? Am I a thankful person or a critical person? Am I a joyful person or a cranky person? Am I a contented person or a covetous person? Am I a godly person or a carnal fleshly person? Am I a gentle and patient person or an impatient, contentious person? Am I a worshipful person or a condemned person? urge you to download the slides this week and do a little old-fashioned Bible slate or come next week to Sunday school as we actually look up and went through all these verses. But for sake of time, let's look at our next point. A godly person seeks to flee evil and pursue righteousness. To flee evil and to pursue righteousness. L notice our verse here. But those who want to get rich and fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires plunge them into themselves into ruin and destruction. There's, there's where your money gets you. The pursuit of money, it says, is the root of all evil. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They think they'll be satisfied in it, but instead they, they load themselves with just many griefs. Because why? Oh, that new car didn't satisfy me. That vacation didn't satisfy me. Some who have even gone through many divorces, that new spouse didn't satisfy me. I'll always remember my next door neighbor building a fence. I helped him build a fence. And when we first introduced him, ourselves to him, he, he's like, oh, you're one of those, right? <laughs> Christians, right? Invite me to church. I don't want anything to do with that. That's not me. Ah, oh, fine. But it was interesting then when I actually showed some love to him, helped build a fence and brought the whole youth group. Forty kids helped knock out the fence in two hours, which would have taken him the whole week. Pretty cool. He finally sits down, we're sweating there, and I can hear, hear every heartbeat, heartbeat of his heart tick because he just had a valve transplant. So it's kind of like, Chad, I'm dying. <laughs> Tell me about Christ. <laughs> Time's limited here, right? Here are the ticks. <laughs> and he sat there and he says, okay, pastor, I admit, I hate my life and I hate my wife. Now, what do you say about that? I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> there's an introduction. <laughs> and come to find out, guess what number of wife he was on? Five. Fifth wife hated her. And his greatest reason why I think he actually hated me is he saw my two girls, and he had two girls. And a long time ago, in his first wife, he had forsaken his own family for the love of pleasure and never had the relationship I had with my dear ones. And now in his fifth wife, not satisfied, hates his life, hates his wife. What do you say about that? I would say to him, because you're condemned. You don't, you're not living for what you're made for. It's about loving God, knowing God, serving God, worshiping God. And as long as you're serving or pursuing anything of yourself, you will be empty. You'll be hating your life, piercing yourself with many griefs. They, the, the new car, the new this or that never stays new, never satisfied. And that's why a true Christian flees these things. We flee them. We run from them. MacArthur has a great sermon. If you ever get to listen to it, he gives it at the beginning of every chapel or seminary year. And he says, a godly man, he says, is known by what he flees from and what he flees to. A great passage on this very one. Listen up, much probably better than this sermon. Hit me, impacted me. And I got to flee from these to be a man of God. And I, I got to pursue the right things, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Can I say, is that what your pursuit is? And then let me ask you a hard question. Prove it to me. Show me by your time, your thoughts, and your money where you're investing in any of these five things. Wow. Now that would put some of us on the hot seat, right? Wait, I got very little thought. I got very little time. I got very little my treasure going towards these five things. And I would say, you're not really pursuing it. Let's just be honest with you. You're, you're a fake. You're a fraud. Sometimes I am. And I got to flee these things that take my time, my thought, my treasure, my time, talent, treasure, that are investing in worthless things. And I got to put them in these things at last. What are they? Here they are. Righteous, right living, godliness, good worship, Faith, trusting in God for the future and him alone to satisfy me and, and to make my life what it, love of God, a selfless love and perseverance because I got it's not easy and gentleness. You got any receipts for investments in these categories? 
Are you fleeing these things the world is, is, is buying for your time? Isn't Satan a, a mastermind of stealing your time? I was reading an article this week that with the onset of the internet, they're doing research at how much time is wasted in the office of people clicking over to different websites and not really working. Or all these distractions. I got to check the news. I got to check my, uh, my portfolio. I got to check my bank account. I got to check my email. And we're not very productive. I say, be careful of distractions. Flee from them. And then this word for a pursuit, you got to pursue, you got to fight hard to stay on the right things and keep pursuing the right things. It's it literally, it's even used in other ways of per- persecuting or putting to flight. We got to really work that hard to grab on to what's hard because Satan's always fighting us. Our flesh is always fighting. The world's always fighting us to get us off course. The biggest one, can I tell you, is how you start your day. This pastor, I hate to say, I wish I could say, 20 years ago, I nailed down my quiet time. I always wake up early, get the first fruits of the Lord, spend that first three to four hours in prayer like George Mueller. I've memorized the Bible in my 15th year of ministry, and I, I can't say that. But you know what? I, here's a practical application. Maybe you're like Chadler. I came back from the funeral. I said, you know what? I got to get back. I got to go back to the basics. And I've been setting my alarm clock and pressing snooze. So you know what my simple solution was? I bought this industrial size alarm clock. It's now about 30 feet from my, my bedroom. It, it bugs the thunder out of me. I have to get physically out of bed, and I've resolved that I'm not going to get back into bed after I press the snooze button. Why? Because I'm going to be an early riser. I'm going to be a first God seeker, giving him the first fruits, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change, amen? So if you want to borrow my alarm clock, you can have it. It really bugs me, <laughs> Right? But I say, go back to the basics. Get yourself in the first part of your days, your power time, your your non-negotiable time. Get that with the Lord. Pursue it. Then notice this, Romans 12, 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. You got to flee the evil. And lastly, it's a fight. A godly person seeks to fight the good fight in longing for eternity. A godly person seeks to fight the good fight in longing for eternity. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called when, he made, when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We got to fight the good fight. You know what? I learned something new, and it's always interesting how you learn something new, Dennis. This word fight is the word agonizomai. And this is the same word in Jude 1, 3, which says, Beloved, I was, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. I felt it necessary to write to you, appealing you, that you contend earnestly. There it is. Agonizomai, contend or fight earnestly for the faith or the doctrine which was once for all handed down to the saints. It is a fight for true doctrine in this day and age, my friends. And it is with agony that you have to fight for it sometimes. You will not be popular if you, speak, if you preach the truth in love. You will be disregarded. You will be maligned. You will be gossiped against. You will be seen as, uh, uh, you know, relabeled as proud because you are confident in the doctrine or whatever they may do to malign your character. And I would say to you, we have to have it agonizomai for doctrine. Fight the good fight of faith. And this word for faith, when used as a noun, is usually for the word doctrine. The faith is this body of knowledge or truth that is once for, ha- uh, once for all handed down to the saints to protect, to guard, to treasure, to love, to say, Lord, make this true in my life and what I know and what I live, what I think about and what I do. Is there any agony in your life for the faith? Any fight? We fight for a lot of things. Yesterday I fought for, a, shouldn't have fought for a call on the soccer field. It was a handball. I knew it. And then after the game, I had really made a rabble about it and, and uh, shouldn't have. And one of the little girls on my team says, Coach, I was right there. It was close, but he didn't touch the ball. Great. <laughs> Go out to this referee. I apologize profusely. My player said he didn't touch the ball. Please forgive me. I fought for a dumb call in soccer this week. But did I, fight for my, did I fight that hard or yell that loud for my thought life, for my quiet time life, for my devotional life? Did I fight that hard to stay up early and, and, and agonizomai contend for the prize, the struggle, the heavenly call were to Christ and Christ Jesus? Listen to Philippians 3.8. 
More than now, I count all things as lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained it or I've already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Wow. Lord, help me do that. Help me to fight the good fight. So in closing, a little application time, reflection time. Are you growing? Are you, are, are you maintaining or sliding or falling? I think if you're not growing, you may be maintaining, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, but you kind of, you're not really, you know, as First Timothy says, let your progress be evident to all. That's in the rest of this passage. But oftentimes, if you think you're just standing still, really you're, you're sliding. You're backsliding. Or if you're really honest, you're just in a free fall, buddy. You're falling. You're rebelling. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. And Colossians 1, 3 through 12 says that we should be growing up into all things, into him, the head of Christ Jesus. Constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Are you increasing? Are you growing? Do you know more about him this year than last? Are you winning more people to Christ than, than last? Are you praying more than last? Are, is your character more like him than last? Or are you just kind of the same in a rut and kind of just the same old, same old? What kind of person are you? Are you growing? 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we ought to always thank God for you, brethren. He says, because your faith is greatly growing or enlarged and the love of one of you is growing all the more even greater. Can we say that about our church? Our love for one another is more now than in 2008 when we started this church or more than last year or first Peter 2, 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to something. Are you growing? Do you long for the word or are you dead and kind of just numb, you know, just kind of blah, Are you growing? Be careful that you're not carried away by unprincipled men and fall from your steadfastness. Remember that God, 1 Corinthians 3 says, he causes all things the growth. It's not you, it's God. As much as you're connected into the vine. Are you connected in the vine? Ephesians 4. Are you growing in your faith and your knowledge to the mature man, having more fullness of Christ every year of your life? Building itself other in love, knowing are you building, are you growing in love? So are you maintaining, are you sliding, or are you falling? I would just say to you, make it your goal then to change. And here's just some very practical ways to change. Maybe you're saying, Lord, Chad, I'm not growing. I've kind of just been maintaining. Or, man, I've kind of just seen a steady slide in my life. Or I just admit, I'm, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit, man. I'm in sin right now. Can I tell you, humble yourself in prayer. That's the first step. Cry out to God and say, God, I can't change myself. You've got to change me. You've got to help me to hate what is evil and to cling to what is good. You've got to give me power to say no to sin, which I am helpless and powerless to do in myself. Lord, you've got to do the work in me. I can't do it on my own. You then got to saturate your mind with, with the scripture. You've got to get back in the word, go back to the basics. You've got to fill your mind with truth so that truth comes out or else it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. But we want truth in, truth out. Then you gotta, you got to seek accountability. You can't do it on your own. Can I tell you, if you're struggling with a sin, you're struggling with a discouragement, you're struggling with a major decision, that's what the elders are here for. Call us up and say, brother, pray for me in this. Or what's your wisdom in, for me in this? I, I appreciate this. We had a major decision to make on our, our, this car that Marissa was in an accident and what to do with it. And we got counsel from my dad and, and from many of you. And it was all green lights and we made the right decision. And guess what it was? Keeping that old ugly van. 
Man, when you look at the new ones, you're like, oh, wow. You could press the button and the doors open by themselves. I don't even have to lift the back hatch with my, with my shoulder muscle. It has clean carpets, not even stains from kids. It smells new, not like myself. It drives. But the best thing was like, be content with what you have, Chad. Seek accountability. Ask them to pray for you, encourage you, counsel you, and if necessary, even discipline you and rebuke and correct you so that you may be sound in the faith. And say, I'm seeking. This week I had an opportunity to say, for three months, I'm seeking on a certain way to be in a certain way. And I asked somebody to pray for me that I help me get in this three-month goal to live like this without this or putting on this and ask people to, to embark in the journey with you. Finally, do you have radical amputation? Sometimes we're like, oh, I'm fleeing from it, but it's like right here. You know, hey, I'm fleeing from it, but I can just go through that door anytime I want. If the doors aren't locked or if you haven't thrown away, if you haven't radically cut off the sin, it's availability, it's proximity, it's access to you, then you haven't really fled. You don't really hate it. You haven't truly repented. You have to hate it. You have to, you have to hate the evil, cling to what is good. You have to flee uh, the lust, the temptations, the war against your soul. And then this last one, you must have radical imputation. You got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, clothe yourself with Jesus, his thinking, his actions, his character. And you have to make a resolve that says, I'm going to say no to that trash, that filth, that spam, that counterfeit, that poison, that trap, that deception. That's death to me. That is no good to me. That's never satisfied me in the past. So why would I be a dummy to think it'll ever satisfy me in the future? I'm saying no to sin and yes to righteousness. I'm saying no to myself and flesh and yes to Jesus. And I'm saying, Lord, I am your man. I will do and say and go anywhere you want me to do. Have your way with me, O oh God. I am here to do your will, O oh God. Is that your cry today? Let's pray. Father, help us to be a godly person. Help us to be a godly and holy church that we just don't know the information, but then our lives don't reflect its actual beauty, its love, its holiness, its separation from sin. Father, may our unbelieving friends and workers and relatives see the difference in us and how we speak and how we talk and how we think and how we act and, and in our countenance, Lord, that we would be a joyful, thankful, contented person. Oh God, guard us from the gangrene of sin and the allurements, Lord, that, that tempt us to think we can be satisfied in anything else but you. Lord, help us to say no to greed and materialism and fame and pleasure and anything, Lord, that exalts itself over and above you, that you would be the sole direction and satisfaction of our lives, Lord. Content us in you and help us to understand this secret of godliness, I pray. In Jesus' name I pray and God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you for listening. I pray for you that you will be godly. Pray for your pastor this week. You are dismissed.